Thanks uh, for agreeing to have this uh, short interview here with us today. Um, your presentation here at the Centre for South European Studies a few days back uh, dealt with Josip Szymonic, who is a 36-year-old football player who is currently captain of Dinamo Zagreb Football Club and also a player for the Croatian national team still. Um, the title of your presentation somehow alludes to a controversial incident from last November, uh, including Szymonic, which occurred following uh, Croatia's victorious play against Iceland and resulted ultimately in the qualification for this year's uh, World Cup in Brazil. And just to sort of uh, uh, very uh, quickly remind everyone what happened um, that evening in Zagreb, so having failed to uh, qualify directly for the tournament, Croatia was uh, doomed to play a barrage against Iceland and uh, that evening uh, was the second game they had to play after a draw uh, against them in uh, Reykjavik and uh, they emerged victorious with a 2-0 win and ultimately qualified as set. So after, after them winning, uh, Josip Szymonic in a very heated atmosphere with a lot of fans being very uh, sort of emotionally charged, um, snatched an announcer's microphone and addressed the Croatian fans on all four stands, if I can remember correctly. And uh, he addressed them by saying, Uboj, Uboj, Zanagotsvoj, and with uh, continuous Zadom, 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 Zadom to all four stands. And in between his calls, uh, some members of the crowd um, responded in unison with Spremni. Mm -hmm. So for those who know or who don't know, this is no ordinary slogan, but was the official salute of the fascist independent state of Croatia. And has been also used by, and is still being used by extremist nationalist groups in the 90s, but also today. Um, but the critical uh, response in Croatia and internationally was rather immediate, I would say. And it was fairly obvious that FIFA had to uh, respond to that pressure coming from, from media and, and individuals. And ultimately, and this ban was confirmed a couple of days back, uh, they banned Šimunic for 10 official games, which at his age and uh, prior to the World Cup coming up, uh, basically meant a termination of his career in the national team. Yes. So, uh, now to uh, come to your, your presentation. So, you developed this notion that uh, Schumannisch action uh, from last year cannot be understood outside of its Australian context. Um, Schumannisch, who is Australian born and also Australian socialised. Um, can you elaborate a bit on, on that context of the Croatian diaspora in Australia and the socialization of Šimunic and other kids like him in that, in that period? And, um, yeah. I will. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again for the invitation and uh, for the allowing me to do the talk and now following it up uh, here. Uh, I, it was something I hadn't expected to be talking about, certainly in, in, in this type of context, and then uh, Jos Josip Šimunic. Uh, gets involved in the activity that you've just outlined. And I can say that in the way that it, it struck me, reading online about the news, uh, it, was, it was rather, you know, quite, quite uh, astounding. And, and I was surprised to hear about the, the, the way that he behaved after that game. And it did prompt me to think then how much that had to do with him being an Australian, and part of that uh, Croatian diaspora in Australia from a a first generation Australian, but uh, raised in a particular type of way. The link that I can make personally in, in terms of how I would bring some expertise to this type of uh, uh, discussion and the, the reflection that I'm making is based on the PhD research that I did a number of years ago now, back in the early 1990s, with a group of young men who were the followers of what is now Sydney United Football Club, what was back in that time, uh, Sydney Croatia Football Club. And I spoke the other day at some length about the uh, de ethnicizing of football, or soccer as it's mm -hmm. called there in Australia, and how this impacted on uh, particular migrant groups, Croatians very particularly, mm -hmm. uh, who had a view that they developed the sport within that country, certainly since the Second World War. The club, this was reflected in club names 
and the organisation of the National League, and this was stripped away from them, and they were responding to that. And it got very much tied up within a way that they regarded their life as, as Croatians being affected. Mm -hmm. Now, Šimić was a, a boy uh, at that time, about 14, um, around the time I was doing the study. But from everything I can establish, uh, he would have came to come through a similar type of socialisation process to the young fellows I, I, I was studying. And these were guys who'd grown up as first generation mm -hmm. Australians in, in, a, in a background where they were using the football terrace to express quite a nationalistic mm -hmm. type of uh, um, uh, pride in what they regarded as being Croatian. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in the way your research deals uh, with something Benedict Anderson calls long distance <clears throat> nationalism, and um, I was wondering, so if you 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 um, just mentioned it, could you stress a bit this this? Uh, I mean, could you sort of elaborate a bit more on the migrational history and the background of the Croatian community in Australia in connection to how this community reasserted or yeah reasserted their Croatianness? Through football, or but also through other markers of identity. Sure. And yeah. Right. I'm not an expert on mm. on uh, Croatian migration to Australia, but obviously I, I investigated that area uh, to do the PhD. Uh, Croatians came to Australia as far back as the 1850s mm. and through that latter part of the 1800s mm. to work the gold fields, mm. uh, particularly in the the southernmost mainland state of Victoria. And this is still reflected in the history uh, because something in excess of 35% of uh, Croatians are located in that state, mainly in Melbourne. Mm. Um, the main area of migration from that time, and I think in, uh, as, it, as it went on, mm. was from Dalmatia. Mm. Um, the, the, the big influx of, mm. of migrants from, from Croatia uh, came in the 1960s and 1970s. Mm -hmm. So in that, you know, some years after the Second World War, when there was a shift away from mm -hmm. migration from uh, from Britain, or at least it needed to be topped up to, to, to uh, uh, satisfy uh, certain labour schemes that the Australian governments had, had, uh, had operating. And so by, but of course, in, we were then talking about migrants from Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. and so it's very difficult to get uh, a gauge on how many people uh, in those times were uh, were actually from Croatia. But the census from the early 1970s, 71 as I recall, was indicating something like around 130,000 people who were Yugoslav born. By 1990, 1991 census, so it's an important time in, in the history, uh, for Croatian people, it was something like uh, in excess of 160,000 uh, uh, people f still showing as Yugoslav born. Mm -hmm. uh, the first census that I'm aware of that, that actually showed people who identified as Croatian would have been in 2006, mm -hmm. and by that time it was around 50,000 people identifying as Croatian. Um, the Croatian community now is one that is. is regarded as an, as an aging migrant community, something in excess of, it's not up to 50%, but somewhere in the 40% 40, 40 range uh, would be over 60. Mm -hmm. And this in a way maybe is there was some mm -hmm. something to do with a feeling of, even back to the 90s, a feeling of needing to, to retain mm -hmm. a connection to, you know, some understanding of what it is to be Croatian mm -hmm. and what is a traditional, you know, mm -hmm. community. No, that, that is very interesting. In, in, in some way, you um, you uh, argue that um, this this needs to reassert a certain uh, notion of Croatianness um, by Bashimonic uh, during that game uh, was was uh, was uh, had its roots in the this socialization among this type of uh, football fans and and, and kids. And uh, could you just you sort of hinted at uh, the, the nationalist character of yeah. these organisations. Could you just very briefly sort of outline what were their main 
uh, Marcus of Identity, when he came to Croatian history, how did they sort of yes. ide identify themselves as Croatian, and what were important dates in 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 uh, throughout Croatian history for them? Yes, I need to I need to comment on that because the group I studied was a very particular group who I identified themselves as uh, the hardcore type of ultra mm -hmm. fans who supported uh, Sydney United or Sydney Croatia. They were actually called themselves the Bad Blue Boys and they'd taken this name from a similar ultra type group that's uh, well known in its following of mm -hmm. uh, the Dinamo Zagreb mm -hmm. uh, Football Club in Croatia. In terms of their background, and I, I did, it's important to say that I did the the study as a PhD study back over 20 years ago uh, for a, a PhD in sociology. So my interest was in focusing on this group of young men called the Bad Blue Boys. And I was very interested in their life world. And so that's what I was interested in, in studying. And they're not necessarily representative overall, and they're certainly not actually representative of the Croatian community overall, but they were to my view, a significant and, and mm -hmm. certainly for a sociologist an interesting part of that community. But as they were hardcore football supporters, you might also argue that they were kind of hardcore end of a, of a, of a migrant group in regard to them being quite nationalistic and, and, uh, and mixing that, that in with quite a militaristic sort mm -hmm. of understanding of, of life mm -hmm. and of history. And they they had a, a view of Croatian history that they claimed, on a, and I mentioned the ethnography, so I'm taking it from their, their own, own words, mm -hmm. from an oral history mm -hmm. that they'd taken from their, either their, and I'm thinking male here because that was what I had said to me, fathers or uncles mm -hmm. who told them that a history of Croatian struggle mm -hmm. that dated back over over time, back into the time of the Habsburg mm -hmm. Empire, but, but you know beyond that, and certainly through to the time of the Second World War, and a key figure for these guys coming into to more modern history was Ante Pavlovich, who is known as a, a, a collaborator during the Second World War period with, with the Nazis. They understood this to, to a, a certain level, but their interpretation mm -hmm. was of, of this, this character as a, a freedom fighter. Mm -hmm. This is an actual term that they used. And they would, he kind of, in a way, was the main, I don't know how much they'd read about him, whether they'd read anything about his, his, uh, his words, speeches, things he might have said, but they certainly adopted, adopted him as a key historical figure. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you argue very compellingly that uh, one has to take into consideration this uh, historical um, aspects of 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 uh, socialization, and I would like to thank you for that uh, and for your presentation. But uh, sort of uh, coming to a conclusion of the interview, I'd sort of like to ask you something a bit more, a bit more general, um, concerning concerning sports studies as a discipline. Mm -hmm. And uh, one can't help to uh, notice that sports studies has, still remains to a certain degree. At the margins of humanities and social sciences, particularly when dealing with Southeastern Europe, and your your research, for example, or research of many others, shows, uh, however, that there is a myriad of theoretical and methodological approaches one can choose when dealing with the social phenomenon of sport. Um, and you have been, as someone who's uh, just edited a, and, and a volume on uh, a special issue of, of sports and society, it's coming out as a book as well. Uh, dealing with the social roles of sport in former Yugoslavia. What is your view on the future of sport-related research in the region? Um, where can you sort of identify pressing fields of future research and what do you think can sport tell us about the region that other social fields or other disciplines have uh, thus far failed to do? I'm obviously, you know, the sort of <laughs> slightly best in interest because I'm a professor of sport and cultural studies. But I, I, I do strongly believe, that just from a from a, an intellectual position, it, it surprised me. If I actually go back to my PhD days, I, it surprised me when there was so much. I give it as an example: res, um, research and academic work within uh, Australian sociology about uh, ethnicity and multiculturalism, but very, very little 
on the sport. And when I started to examine this, uh, or just hear this talking in uh, the media about about football and the de-ethnicizing issue, I, it amazed me that people weren't studying it because this was, you know, very much, uh, you know, a field of what's actually going on in society that that has to do with um, with the things that sociologists would want to be studying. And I, and I take that forward into to most areas. And I, I would be answering, even if we weren't talking about um, the, the region of the world that we are discussing, uh, I would be saying similar things. To, to certainly most of the countries I know, uh, sport is an incredibly important uh, area of, of social life to, to many, many people. Even those excluded from it have something to say about why they're excluded from it. But certainly, if we go to themes of uh, nationhood and nationalism, I can, for most of the, the countries I know, I, I can't imagine a generalist sort of book talking about such and such a nation not having some uh, something to say about sport. And so, if we apply that to the countries of the, the former Yugoslavia, mm. uh, certainly the two that I know best, mm. Croatia and Serbia, uh, I think sport is, is very much, or should be at the forefront of intellectual minds because the, the main acceptable way of, of uh, expressing nationhood in forms of contest, in forms of celebration, in forms of festivals, it's not ex exclusively so, there might be other, other areas, but sport mm -hmm. is very, very prominent. So I think those studies should go on. I mean, the, the book that I've edited, which includes chapters by a number of young scholars, including myself, is certainly not meant to be the last word. I mean, it's, it's just uh, hopefully something that initiates studies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can say more, but... Uh, no, on that note, sort of, I would like to thank you uh, again for being here, for uh, having the talk with me now, but also for giving the presentation a few days back. And I hope to see you back in Graz at the Centre for Southeast European Studies sooner or later. I hope so too. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.